Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live on our Patreon channel. And uh, this message is very in-depth. Very, very in-depth. We're going to be tackling the firmament. Uh, and I'm doing this not because of maybe what some of the things that most people would probably think. Oh, flat Earth theory or um, different people that believe uh, have different beliefs regarding the firmament and that it's just a dome over the earth, etc. Um, I actually got into this because of the book of Romans. Uh, that initially started it. If you remember, it's such a confusing chapter. Uh, for example, when Paul says in verse 19, and this is Romans chapter 7, verse 19, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now I do that I would not, it is no more that I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. When you look at this chapter, it is very, very confusing. And oddly enough, when you're dealing with Genesis uh, chapter 1, it is really the same thing. There's not much difference. Uh, in Genesis 1, we see on the first day, God creates the heaven and the earth. He creates the light. The darkness separates the two. And in day three, he's doing it all over again. Well, that seems a little bit odd. But most people never even pay attention to that. And this is what got me into wanting to look more at the firmament. Because I see it. And I figure maybe others do as well. Uh, and it will take us into the, uh, some people call it a theory, that the, earth, uh, the hollow earth theory. Like we would say the flat earth is a theory, the hollow earth theory, and then the globe earth. Well, most people don't even consider that a theory because they say it's, the proof is there. Uh, but when it comes to hollow earth, a lot of people would say that's a theory as well. And then we have this German map uh, that I've got right here on the screen for you. And in this German map, uh, the Germans actually are mapping the inner earth. Yeah, believe it or not, I'll show you some of the pictures here that they have of that. This is the actual pictures of the oceans and the land mass that is inside of there that the that the Germans document uh, from the inner earth. You have that one there. You have this one over here. Um, different oceans that they talk about. Uh, and, you know, and those oceans being inside of inner earth as well. Uh, so as crazy as that might sound to some, uh, the Germans actually do declare that it is an inner earth. And so, you know, I mean, figure that one out, right? It's not an easy thing just to wrap your head around. Um, and the very verbiage here, the title here in German uh, reads, the instructions must be strictly followed. Uh, now, I don't know what these instructions are. I don't read German, but uh, I actually have a friend that does, and maybe I should get him to explain to me what these instructions instructions actually mean. Uh, but, you know, like I said, though, when you're dealing with flat earth, flat earth, according to the Germans, was not, uh, excuse not flat earth, but hollow earth was not uh, a conspiracy. It's It's real. And, uh, and, of course, they believe that there was a portal or an entrance down in uh, South America. I did speak to one, um, uh, one pilot one time that actually told me about that when you would fly, the military that flies there, so when you're flying over that region, you would fly right into the center of the earth and never know you left the surface of the earth. That's how vast it is, and you don't even realize you went in. Uh, so you have, besides the Germans, you also have the Indian, uh, uh, we'll call it uh, religious beliefs of the hollow earth theory. You have the Hopi Indian also that believed in that. And, uh, and of course, Admiral Byrd, uh, his going down to Antarctica also. Uh, and through the different intel channels that I've had, I've heard about it. I've heard that this is a well-guarded secret, etc. So... That's an interesting fact altogether. Now, and the only reason I bring up the hollow earth part is because when we go to get into this uh, subject here, you're going to find out that I think it has a lot to do with what's written in Genesis and where we might be able to understand really what the firmament is. Um, 
So let's continue on there. I want to start, though, with uh, Amos. And I think this is interesting as well. We're going to start with the book of Amos here before I go into Genesis. Uh, and I and I think you'll understand better why as we read this here together. Um, anyway, let's let's go here to verse 11. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst of water, but hearing of the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. And that day shall the fair virgins and the young men faint for thirst. Now, why? Here's the one thing, if you think about this, that I find fascinating is why does the scripture limit this only from wandering from north to east? That's not even a directional thing that makes any sense. You know, you're going to go from the north and then we're going to go over to the east. Why not north to south or west to east or east to west or south to north? Something like that. It actually says north to east. And they shall run to and fro, seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Hmm. But they're looking. It's like something has been hidden. Something is missing. And it even says they're going to go from miyam at yom, which is from sea unto sea. Well, if you take the Hebrew words here on your screen, I will rehide. Here's the word north right here, what we translate as north. U mitzfon. Okay, because it's literally and from. The, the vav and the mem means the vav is and, the mem is from. Tzifon. Ve'ad mizrach. The word tzifon in Hebrew means hidden. And the word zirach over here is proceeds. So to me, it's more of a, we might call it a subliminal message in Hebrew. They're going from sea unto sea, not the seas on the earth, but I think from the sea on the above ground of the earth and to the sea in the inner earth. From the north, from the what's hidden, to the east, to what preceded. Now, if you're watching, uh, you guys are watching here on Patreon. I, I, in fact, I just released that yesterday to the general public as well. The video I did on Nimrod's Tower. And where it said that they traveled east and found the city of Shinar. And I allude to the possibility that the reason why they went east was the preceding was to get the, the technology. They had found the technology of the fallen angels. And that was really why we see the part about the east. I think the same thing applies here. And not only do we find out there's a famine in the land, not for famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but the hearing of the words of the Lord. And I find it interesting hearing as if maybe there was some type of technology to where you could be, to where the words of God were recorded at one time. And so they're literally looking for it. And if they go from sea to sea, and then what do you have right here? We have the Germans were doing exactly that. The Germans were looking and they did exactly that. They didn't just go. To the east, to the north, they even went into the inner earth to where the seas are there. They were searching for the hearing of the word of the Lord. Somebody, I can't help but wonder if they don't think that God had a recording machine back then because they have found advanced technology. I mean, we go back, look, I shared with you on that Nimrod video, uh, you know, they were doing brain surgery 3000 BC. They were doing artificial eye implants that were so advanced we have nothing like it today. And we've actually unearthed those things. 200 BC, modern battery that would, I mean, I mean what are you going to use a battery for if you don't have electrical devices to attach it to? Right? 
I mean, think about it. What are you going to create a battery for if you don't have a light bulb or something that that battery is going to run? You're just going to create a battery for what? Sticking your fingers on and electrocuting yourself? Stick your tongue to it and watch your tongue twist? If they had batteries in Iran 200 BC, imagine what they were using it for. You didn't just have a battery to have a battery. You had to have something that it would power. Logical deduction there, right? Uh, and again, the Iranians also talk about these metal birds that would come that would bring technology, hidden technology. So when I look at what Amos says here, they're looking for all these secrets. And, you know, are they going to find it? Hmm. Well, I don't think they found to be able to hear the word of the Lord yet, but they definitely did uh, find some very advanced technology in the process of it. But that brings us, though, to Genesis. And this is where I want to share with you, I think, some fascinating things here. Let's look at it together. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, uh, that's when, uh, that's interesting in itself right there. Okay. The darkness was was over the face or upon the face of what we call the deep or the abyss. It was just dark. Okay. The Ruach Elohim and the Spirit of God. Um, I mean, Elohim is plural. I'll just say that and leave it at that. Mechafet alpene hamaim. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Ve'yomer Elohim yahi or ve'yahi or ve'yora Elohim et ha'or kitov ve'yavdil Elohim ben ha'or uven ha'choshech. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. Now, did you notice the light is created on the first day? The darkness and the light are separated on the first day. Correct? Did I read anything wrong there? No, nothing, right? So, nothing different there. We go into verse 6. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Okay? Ve'yehi rakia betoch ha'mayim ve'yehi mavdil bein mayim lamayim. And God made the firmament. I'm not going to do everything in Hebrew here. I'm just kind of putting some of this together because Hebrew plays a crucial role in this here. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. Now, there's something you have to understand on day one to understand what is happening here in verses uh, six and seven. So I'm going to back up and I want you to see something here. All right, God, God, all right, we're just going to do this in English to start with. Now the earth was unformed and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. Most of the time, people just think the deep, thinking the waters that are here on the surface of the earth. It's not. It's not. All right. This is what's important that you understand. Alpane. Tahum, right? The Tahum is the abyss. That's inner earth. Okay? 
Now the earth was unformed and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, the tachum. Uh, maybe here, let me just look and see. I'm using two different screens, guys. That's why I look up, look down. So maybe more so so I can look with you guys because I remember somebody asked me, did you sleep through that video, Steve? Because I'm looking down watching the video, and I guess when you're looking down watching the video on the computer screen in front of you here, it looks like your eyes are closed. No, it's not, not the case. Let's go to Genesis here real quick. I want to show you something when we do this. Let's see. All right. Uh, God saw the light. It was good. Okay. All right. It was on the face of the deep. Here we go. Tahum. All right. Uh, it is an abyss. There it is right there. H 1949, an abyss as surging mass of water. But in this case here, normally we think of the abyss. All right. Let's look at let's let's do like this here. Um, let me see. I don't know if they even have that word like that. I don't I didn't think so. Let's go to Abaddon. Uh, they don't even have it in there that either. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. I know it's in the book of Revelation. Was it? Uh, is it? Oh, gosh. I may be spelling that wrong. Um, I think it's Revelation 9, though. Let me just, let's pull up Revelation 9. Dark and reason of the smoke out of the pit, the furnace, and the sun. Okay. Bottomless pit. And you open the bottomless pit. Uh, abuso, let's see, a variation of the depthness that is specifically infernal, abyss, there we go, right there. So in G12, we have it in the Greek, uh, the abyss, <clears throat> and there arose a smoke out of the pit, and the smoke of the pit, all right, so there we have it right there, okay. Out of the bottomless pit, we have right there the abyss, abusos, the Greek, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by the reason of the smoke of the, of the pit. And there came out of the smoke of locust upon the earth. <clears throat> Notice, in order to get up on the earth, it has to come out of the earth to get up on the earth, these locusts and stuff. So it's the, that abyss is inside of what we might call inner earth. All right. So just want to set that stage for you. So now the earth was unformed, void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, or on the face of the of the abyss. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. Because literally, and you got to keep in mind, at that time, when you look at inner earth, and I'll just go back to this German map here. Um, not sure how well. Let's see here. We'll back up. Yeah, I think this. No, not that map. It must be the other map. Whoop. Let's go. To, 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 to. Is it here? Let's see. Ah, right there. Down there is where they show the opening. They show the opening in the south uh, of the ocean here. But, you, like I said, if you're looking at this, Keep in mind, depending on the width of that opening there, and the way it's been told to me from the intelligence circles on that, from the secret space program we have there, is that um, when you're traveling by plane, if you actually are able to fly over that area, you would fly right into the inner Earth, not even realizing you flew into it. It's just like, for example, all right, if you go from, from north to south, you don't realize you're upside down, do you? Now, my flat earth friends, and listen, I'm not here to pick on anybody and their beliefs on these issues, okay? So I'm not here to pick on you guys at all, right? I know, though, that you would argue, well, the earth is flat. That's why you don't feel like you're upside down. Uh, and even if you were flat and you're in space, which way's up, which way's down? Why are all the other stars circles? Why is the moon a circle? Why is everything, and I mean, I've got some powerful cameras, so I, you know, I was able to zoom in on Jupiter and Venus when they're here and photograph them, uh, and they're all circumferences, you know, 
why are we the only place in the universe that's not? And knowing that these planets also have oceans on them in some cases, why isn't the water just falling off? All right, so which way's up, which way's down, that type of thing there. So again, this is not to pick on anybody's ideas. What I'm trying to get you to understand, though, is when you fly in, you wouldn't even realize you you change land mass because we see it in the we see it on a map right here and it just looks like a little tiny opening there but that little tiny opening uh may be as big or as wide as the state of florida or even wider than the state of florida uh that may be say the the width of alaska well, if you're in a plane flying over alaska do you see from one side to the other no you don't florida i know you can um it's a narrow enough state to where you can see, especially at nighttime, you can see from one side to the other, but it's difficult, but you can. Uh, Alaska, I wouldn't think so. And that may be as large as the state of Texas. Imagine trying to see across the entire state of Texas, no matter what your elevation is flying. Um, you're not going to notice it. So when they flew, they said they would fly into inner earth, they didn't even real, they wouldn't even realize they're flying into inner earth. They're already there. All right. So. The point being, I say this because as we're looking at Genesis and the Spirit of God, God hovers over the waters, the waters on the outside, there's also waters on the inside. So the question is, was God hovering over the waters on the inner earth or the outer earth? And we don't really know that, but I would actually argue that he, he was hovering over the waters of inner earth. And as we go into that, you'll see why, because I do believe that Eden was an inner earth. They've not found any place on outer earth that would suggest there's Eden. And the thing is, is God guarded the way. He put the, he put the cherubs, everything, to guard the way to the tree of life. And the tree of life is in the Garden of Eden. I used to argue years ago that the rock that Moses smote was coming. That water came from Eden. I actually thought it was another dimension. And then I found documentation to prove, and not just documentation. I think, I think if I'm not mistaken, it's in the book of Psalms to prove that the water came from Eden itself out of inner earth. That's going to be one that will shock you, right? Let me see real quick if that's in the book of Psalms. Let me see here. Yeah, he cleaved the rocks in the wilderness and gave them to drink abundantly as, as out of the great deep. Whoa. Figure that one out, right? Vayish, vayish, um, what do you say here? Vayishak kit homot rabah. There it is right there, the great deep. And it's actually, it's a little part of that word right there. Uh, ha. Right. Oh, goodness. There it is, the plural of it. And he brought the streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. Now, they say as, but the that comes right there from the letter uh, Chet there. That can have, the, the letter Chet can have multiple me meanings as out of the great deep. But I believe it literally was coming from inner earth. So I, I used to think it was a different dimension, but now that I found this in the book of Psalms here, speaking about the rock being smitten and that water coming out, which by the way, remember the rock was, was Christ Jesus and Christ was smitten also in his sight and both water and blood came out. Different issue altogether. Different amazing insight altogether, right? All right, so let's go back to Genesis. All right, so... And by the way, let me wait a minute. Let me go back to Psalms here, real quick here for you. I'm sorry, right there. Oh, wait a minute. Here to get back in Genesis. Okay. Tahum. It's spelled without the extra vav in there, but there's your word for abyss. Okay, same word, same exact word there. 
and they drink abundantly as out of the great deep or the, and the rabav is the word for great. Uh, and it is the tahum, uh, tahumot in this case here, which is a pluralizing because why? There's more than one ocean within inner earth. Just like we have seven seas here, this is, you know, they're getting the water from the tahumot, from from those depths within inside the inner earth there all right and and I, listen i, I want to tell you and I, and i need to make sure i stress this now that i'm not saying these things as a doctrine i am not uh i am presenting this as a hypothesis for you and the same thing uh we're going to be dealing with some books some writings and stuff that are extra biblical uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, I will even also, there is, I think, one or two places in the Nag Hammadi writings. These are not biblical text, but when I can find something that supports the biblical narrative, I'll share that with you. But please understand, do not take this, same thing with the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's not a biblical text. Although they quote biblical text in there, a lot of times it's rabbis of, of that day that were writing commentaries, etc. Same thing Nag Hammadi. We cannot call that a biblical text. It's not part of the canon, uh, and some of it is very confusing. But, it, but when you have the ability to research and then what validates your canon to, to actually begin to support the, what we have, then I like to at least share that, but as historical reference. We're going to be looking at the book of Enoch as well. And again, it's not canonized, although the, our Bible clearly quotes from the book of Enoch, out of the book of Jude, for example. I even have the book of Jude up. It actually is going to support what we're talking about here. So, Anyway, and we haven't even got into the firmament yet. We're just still getting started. It's a long message, friends. It is a long message. All right, so anyway, so we have the face of the deep there to whom? All right, and so the Spirit of God is hovering over those waters, and that is literally in the abyss. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning, one day. All right, now we already established that's the first day. Then we get into day two, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, okay, and that word is rakia right here, okay, here it is right there, rakia. That's the word for firmament. And I have tried everything I can to try to figure out what is the source origin? How does this word come about? Because see, words are not just merely made. There, there is a, there's something that, that, ex, that explains that word. Because he, he, he said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters, right? Betok hamayim veyahi uh, mevdil, mevdil is to divide from dividing bain uh, maim la maim. Okay, not even the seas, just the waters from the waters. All right, and God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and there was evening, there was morning, a second day. All right, so the dividing of the water is done on the second day. And I believe that firmament is, in reality, inner and outer earth. I believe this may be your firmament. Now, you're going to immediately, people are going to say, well, wait a minute, that don't make any sense, Steve, because God takes and he puts the stars and he puts the sun and the moon and all that kind of stuff. And that's on the outside, not on the inside. We have a natural sun, but we also have the sun of symbolism, a moon of symbolism, stars of symbolism, and though we have natural sun, natural moon, and natural stars as well. And there is a light source on inner earth, um, and they said some type of thing like a sun that actually gives a light on inner earth, uh, and so 
there are some different arguments that could be made there, but we're going to look into all of that. So, like I said, bear with me because this is going to get a little bit odd, right? Now, that's the second day. First day, we already have the light, the darkness. God's already separated light from the darkness. He calls one day, he calls one night. There's evening, there's morning, there's one day. Now he takes, he separates, he puts a firmament between the waters that are above and the waters that are below. And quite frankly, if you go into what we call space, we can't find a source of water above that. We do have a, uh, we have found a ring of fire, which can also be supported in ancient documents as well, that on the outside of that realm there, it is a ring of fire. But that's a different subject, right? So let's go ahead and let's go into verse 9. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. Okay, from under the heavens. All right, now remember, this, this is interesting too. I got to bring this out. I forgot to bring this out to you. When God, see in verse 8, and God called the firmament, Vekra, which means, and he called Elohim, God, La Rakia, he called for the firmament, he called that Shamaim. Now, if the firmament already has the name Rakia, why would he call it a by different name? I'm not really sure, but I do know that the word Shamaim comes from Maim, from the waters. Okay, Maim. Yom is a sea. Maim is waters, but Shamaim is that water. Literally, the, the letter Sheen added to it means that. The, the letter Sheen is just that. That water. Or that waters. So he calls the firmament that waters. And there was evening, there was morning, a second day. All right. Now, third day, and God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. All right. Now, he called it Yamaim. All right, calls it seas. He calls, he called the, um, the gathering together of the waters, which is right here, Hamaim, and he calls it Yamaim, seas. That's in the plural. And God said, let the earth put forth grass, herb yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit after its kind, wherein is the seed of thereof, uh, thereof and upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth much grass, herb yielding seed after its kind, and tree bearing fruit, uh, wherein is the seed thereof after its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, there was morning the third day. Now, it's not got weird yet, but it's fixing to get weird now. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. This is where it gets a little bit weird. This is all going to happen on day four. Okay. On day four, God said, let there be lights in the firmament. of the heaven to divide the day from the night let them be for signs and for seasons for days and years and let them be for lights and the firmament and the heaven to give light upon the earth and it was so and god made the two great lights the lesser the the, the greater light to what rule the day yeah that's exactly what it says right there the mishalat hayom And the lesser light to rule the night. Not only to rule the night, but and the stars. Whoa, 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 whoa. Something is weird, right? 
All right. That's day four. So God has made the sun, the moon, and the stars. We're assuming the sun and the moon, right? The greater light, the lesser light, but and the, but the lesser light rules both stars and night. But yet, I thought God did all that creation of day and night in day one. All right, now now I'm going to, now now I think I got your attention. Now the earth was unformed. Remember, as void, darkness was upon the face of the deep. Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. God said, "Let there be light." There was light, and God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. And there was evening. There was morning. One day. So on the first day of creation, we already got light. We already have darkness. We have a daytime. We have a nighttime. It's already done. How then do we get on day four? God's got to make a new kind of light. And this time, he's not just making a new kind of light. Now he's making a light that's a boss. A light that's going to rule the day and the lesser light's going to rule the night and the stars. starting to make your head think a little bit you can't have one day of creation of light and then another day of creation of light unless it's two different types of light because naturally we look at the firmament idea here and we have to say to ourselves. Well, the firmament has to be on the outside of earth. Even some people would argue the firmament couldn't be on the inside of earth because it had to be on the outside of the earth because we're seeing this here happening on the fourth day. The light or the, the sun, the moon, it doesn't say sun and moon. He just said a light, the rule by the day and a lesser light, rule the night and the stars. But that lesser light is really not just the night, but the stars too. Whoa. Interesting. That greater light is no doubt Jesus Christ. Now, how could I prove such a statement as that? Let's look at Malachi. Behold, the day come comes, it burns as a furnace and all the proud and all the do the work wickedness shall be stubble and the day that comes shall set them ablaze says the Lord of hosts that it shall leave them neither root nor branch but unto you who fear my name shall the sun of righteousness arise with healing and that word is should be his wings interesting and it is Shemesh the exact same word we use for the sun that is up in the sky above us in Hebrew. Shemesh, Shemesh Sadika, the sun of righteousness. He arises with healing in his wings. Fascinating, right? Jesus Christ, the one true healer, is referred to in a prophecy as an S-U-N, son. Believe it or not, that's true. He's not just referred there as son. We even have, and that's where it's going to be a little tricky. i got to figure these out here. Um, I'm going to come to, this is the Dead Sea Scroll one. Let me see if I can find the one I'm looking for here, though. Okay. This one, and I don't know where, I know that, I believe this is in Nakamadi. And again, when I cite this as a source, do not use this as a biblical reference. It is not a biblical reference. It is part of the ancient documents that they discovered down in Egypt. Uh, so what the validity of them are, I'm not going to get into that debate. 
but when I can find something that supports what we're looking at, in this case here, Malachi, I think it's important because everyone would agree that Jesus Christ is the tree of life. All right. Now notice what it says here. Now, um, uh, okay. Now the color of the tree of life is like the sun. And its branches are beautiful, its leaves are like those of the cypress, its roots are like a bunch of grapes when it is white. All right. Um, this is where I thought is interesting because it says the tree of life is like the sun. Um, and I just thought that was interesting. Also, I kind of highlighted this too. Then justice created paradise, being beautiful and being outside the orbit of the moon and the orbit of the sun and the land of wantonness. In the east, in the midst of the stones, in the desire, the midst of the beautiful appetizing trees, and the tree of eternal life is appeared by God's will to the north of paradise, so that it might make eternal the souls of the pure who come forth from the mottled forms of poverty at the consummation of the age. Now the color of the tree of life is like the sun, and its branches are beautiful, its leaves are like the cypress, and its fruit like a bunch of grapes when it is white. Now, the, thing, the reason why I bring this up here as well is because that also, see, it's outside the orbit of the moon and the orbit of the sun of the land of wantonness. That seems to indicate, too, an inner earth, an outer earth um, uh, theory. And, and, of course, my hypothesis, too, is that the Garden of Eden was in inner earth. Um, there was some document I found a long time ago that seemed to support that as well. Uh, when Adam comes out and there's the ocean and the angel has to strike the ocean, turns it to ice, so he has a dry ground to walk across. Uh, interesting thought there. This one here too. Live with Christ and he will save you for he is the true light and the son of life. So, Another reference, now this one is definitely, the other one is just the tree of life. This one here is a direct reference of Jesus Christ, and he will save you, for he is the true light and the son of life. Now notice, though, he's referred to in this document as the true light and the S-U-N of life, the son of life, for just as the sun, which is visible and makes light for the eyes of the flesh, so Christ illuminates every mind and the heart. Okay, illuminates every, right? So he is typed in that regards. So it doesn't surprise us then that Malachi refers to Jesus, not even knowing about Jesus per se, but he's prophesying, my name shall, uh, uh, but unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness, S-U-N, arise with healing in his wings and you shall go forth and, uh, and gamble as calves of the stall. What a fascinating fact. And that happens. What? And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. Now, another one I want to bring out. Look, let's go back to Genesis real quick here. Very interesting, right? God made the two great lights, the greater light, to rule the day. Oh, that just brings up another scripture too. All right. Let's see if I can find it. And it may be wild, so it may be hard to find here. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. John 9, 4. There you go, right there. Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. There you go. I hope you guys can see that clear too. John chapter 9, the Gospel of John chapter 9, verse 4. And what do we have in Genesis? There's the, that greater light rules the day. Because why? Jesus had to work while it was day. The night, man, night comes when no man can work, but that lesser light rules the night. Now, Here's how you know about the rules of the night, right? I'm going to give you another one. Oh my gosh, this is amazing, right? 
amazing to me anyway. Um, Behold, I give unto you power. Luke 10, 19. I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Remember they come back there rejoicing that Satan, Satan is subject to them and he says here, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that, that the, uh, the, the spirits are subject unto you, but that rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So the lesser light, which is the bride of Christ, has power. Not just over the night, the darkness, and that's really what it is, not just over the night, but the darkness, but also over, over the stars as well. Now that's when you get into, like for example, I think in the book of Job, let me, let's, let's jump over here to Job. Um, whereupon were the foundations thereof fastened? Wait, who determined the measures thereof? All right, let me back up just a little bit more. Wherefore was thou, uh, where were you, I'll just do it in plain English, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have the understanding. Who determined the measures thereof, if you know, or who stretched the line upon it? Where were, where were the foundations thereof fastened, and who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. Oh my goodness, what do you know? Stars can sing? He's not talking about the ones up in the sky. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it broke forth and issued out of the womb? Hmm. Those doors, my friend, happen to be the ones that are on the inner earth. When I made the cloud a garment thereof and a thick darkness a swaddling band for it and prescribed for it my decree and set the bars and doors and said, Thus far shall you come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. That's an interesting thought, right? Let's see, also in Job we have here. The waters are congealed like a stone and the face of the deep is frozen. That's the face of the tachum, the abyss. Upane tachum. Itala kadu. The face of the deep, the, the face of the abyss is frozen. North Pole, South Pole. Hello. Hello. You know, in a way that's kind of interesting because you have to agree now when flat earth people, when they talk about, well, you got that big wall of ice. They said if you didn't have that, the waters would fall off. In a way, there's there's some truth of what they're saying. The only difference is, if that wall of ice wasn't there, then the waters that are on the inside might come out. And here you have it written in Job, and the waters are congealed like stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. The face of the abyss. He's telling you the very location of the entrance into inner earth is frozen. The face of the abyss, that like, it's like a bottomless pit almost, you know, because you, know, you just go in here, there's no ending to it. It's just another part of the earth. Can you bind the chains of Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Can you lead forth uh, Maseroth in their season or can you guide the bear and her, son, and her sons? Know you the ordinance of the heavens? Can you establish the dominion thereof in the earth? Wow. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I am mesmerized by some of the things that we read here. Um, now, we looked at J J uh, Malachi there, right? Uh, we got more. We still got more yet to go. And I forget which ones are which on some of these. So I have to just bear with me. Um, you know, I'm going to do this other one, Genesis here. This is just to give you an idea of sun and moon and how that they're not always what you think, Right. And he dreamed yet another dream. This is Joseph. He told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed yet a dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars bowed down to me. By the way, for those Jewish people listening to this broadcast today, 
And for you Christians, that's never been fulfilled. Joseph's dream has never been fulfilled. You might say, oh, no, no, no. His dad came down there when he came down to Egypt and his brothers and they all bowed to him and did all his sons. His mother didn't. His mother was dead. He was prophesying. He was prophesying. But in this case here, Abraham, or excuse me, in this case here, it'd be uh, J uh, Jacob and Rachel and his brothers uh, would come and bow before him. And they're typed as the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars. Now, we also have, let's, let's take, we're going to look at the book of Enoch for a moment here. Let's, let's go down. Let me find it, the book of Enoch. We get into the stars as well in this here. So let's, let's make this big enough for everybody to see. This is Enoch chapter 18, verse 11. I saw a deep chasm of the earth with the pillars of heavenly fire, and I saw among them fiery pillars of heaven which were falling. And as regards both height and depth, they were immeasurable. And beyond this chasm I saw a place and had neither sky above it nor the foundations of the earth below it. There was no water on it, no birds, but it was a desert place. And remember, by the way, I told you the South Pole is the, considered the most desert place on the planet. Less than what? I think less than a half inch of precipitation annually. <laughs> How do we get all that ice up there then? Must have not have been that way originally. And a terrible thing I saw were seven stars like great burning mountains and like a spirit questioning me. The angel said, this is the place of the end of heaven and earth. This is the prison for the stars of heaven and the host of heaven. And the stars which roll over the fire, these are the ones which transgressed the command of the Lord from the beginning of their rising because they did not come out at their proper times. Whoop, sorry about that. Uh, and he was angry with them and bound them until the time of the consummation of their sin in the year of mystery. All right, that's one. Let's look at the other one here. And because of them, men go wrong in them, for these lights really serve the stations of the world. One in the first gate, and one in the third gate, and one in the fourth gate, and one in the sixth gate, and exact harmony of the world is completed in the separate 364 stations of the world. For the signs and the times and the years and the days were showed to me by the angel Uriel, whom the Lord of eternal glory has placed in the charge of all the lights of heaven and heaven in the world, uh, in heaven and in the world, so that they might rule on the face of heaven and appear over the earth and the leaders of the day and night, the sun, the moon, and the stars, all serving creatures who revolve in all the chariots of heaven. Uh, now that's confusing to me. The sun, the moon, the stars, all serving creatures who revolve in the chariots in heaven. Now we have a servitude. Okay, a servitude mentioned. Let's see what we have here. This here also uh, in the book of Enoch, uh, 75, 4, beginning, going to verse 9. Chariot of the sun in the sky from which the rays of the sun come out. From them heat comes over the earth when they are opened and the times are appointed for them. And there are openings for the winds and for the spirit of the dew when they are opened at their, at their times, opened in heaven and the ends of the earth. And I saw 12 gates in heaven and the ends of the earth from which the sun and the moon and the stars and all the works of heaven go out in the east and in the west. And there are many window openings in the north and to the south and each window at its appointed time sends out heat corresponding to those gates from which the stars go out in accordance with his command to them in which they set according to their number. And I saw chariots in heaven running through the region above those gates in which the stars that never set rotate. And one is bigger than all the others and it goes round about the whole world. Uh, still, 
it appears to be a little bit odd, right? Now, this is out of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And to his covenant, their soul shall adhere to the study um, of his mouth. God in the heavens above to examine the paths of the sons of man. There is no place to hide from before him. He created darkness and light for himself. In his dwelling, the perfect light shines and in the shades rest before him. And he does not need to separate light from darkness because for the sons of man, he separated them as the light at daytime and with the sun and night, the moon and the stars. And, and with him, there is unsearchable, unknowable light. For all the works of God are wonderful. We are flesh and we do not understand what is with us. All right. Now here, and I don't recall where this is from, but again, regardless even if you're able to search, do a search and find it in a word search. Always remember, these are not biblical texts, but they are from ancient documents that have been translated. I don't have the original translation to be able to compare it to, so I'm kind of having to trust the translator. But even there, I still would not call it a biblical text, only looking at information that, that is from biblical times that would support the narrative that we're looking at. So we read here, a final opportunity, and the stars will cease from the sky. The mouth of Aaron will be open in order that the evil darkness may become idle and silent. And in the last day, the forms of nature will be destroyed with the winds and all their demons. They will become a dark lump just as they were from the beginning. And the sweet waters which were burdened by the demons will perish. That is so fascinating to me is that the stars which are likened as demons they'll be destroyed with the winds and all their demons and they will become a dark lump just as they were from the beginning that really reminds me going back to genesis that when god hovered over the abyss um, we see, let's see here, the face of the deep or the abyss, when he hovered over it, uh, it was unformed and void. It was like a clump. But he brings about life. But there's already these demonic entities, I guess, that are here at that time. Um, Let's go, let's go further back into, let's get back into Genesis again then while we're here then. All right, we had the, there was, all right, that was the fourth day. To give light upon the earth, right? And to rule over the day and over the night to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, there was morning the fourth day. And like I said, it makes no sense unless it's two different types of light. In this case here, there's one light ruling the day, one light ruling the night and the stars as well. And... Let's see. We get the sea monsters. Everything that swarmed on the earth that was created. In the fifth day. Uh, the living creatures, the cattle, creeping things, beasts on the earth after its kind. That happens in the sixth day. And God says, let us make man after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. And over the fowl of the air, that's done in the sixth day. Now, I'll do this on a different message, but to me, there is a difference what happens in the sixth day here and then what happens in Genesis 2. We'll look at that at a different time there. But again, let's go back, because like I said, that firmament, I believe, is the separation from the seas within the earth and the seas outside the earth. And the creation of the light that rules the day and the lesser light that rules the night, I believe, are more symbolic in verse 16 because it rules the night and the stars. So let's look at some other let's look at some other scriptures that might help support what we're looking at here. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ 
who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Notice the word shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, you servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts. You have 2 Corinthians, and I believe that's Paul writing this letter to the Corinthians there, who has clearly identified that the light that shines out of darkness is the light that shines in our hearts. He is now typing what happens over in Genesis as one light. And let's look at that again. All right. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven. Why is that? Oh, gosh, there we go. Light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser to rule the night and the stars. Okay. And God let them. Uh, and God let them, uh, set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. <laughs> and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And there was evening, there was morning, and the fourth day. To divide the light from darkness darkness uh, well let's go back to Corinthians here again who commanded the light to shine out of darkness for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God to the face of Jesus Christ there you have it now you know that Jesus Christ was one of those lights I believe one is a natural light and I believe the other was a spiritual light which is Jesus Christ. Remember too, when, when there'll be no more sun, there'll be no more moon because Christ himself will enlighten every one of us. Remember that scripture as well? All right. Now I think we already did Jude. Um, These are spots in your feast, charity with feast. Let's see. Yeah, raging. See, what? what look, look at here. This is Jude writing about it. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves with, without fear. Clouds they are without water. Carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withered, withereth. Without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them of all ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all their hard speeches which are ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before by the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, have not the spirit, but you, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ and unto eternal life. All right. But notice what they are. He, he likens them to wandering stars. And what does it say in Genesis? They would rule. That lesser light rules the night and the star. Jesus said, what? Behold, I will give unto you power to tread on serpents and on scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. 
what did the, what did the uh, the Qumran community call the the Pharisees in in, in uh, Israel at that day? He called them sons of darkness. Right, sons of darkness. And what do we what do we have here when we're looking at this? They're ruling both, both darkness and the night, which is darkness, and the stars. It's getting more interesting by the moment. Now, let's go to Matthew. Now, I'm going to do the Hebrew Matthew as well for this. But for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, we're in Matthew 24, uh, verse 27, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will be the eagles gathered together. A lot of people think that's a great verse. It's not. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall the, all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. All right, the sun and the moon are not going to give their light. Hmm, could that be that Jesus and his bride are no longer present? Let's look at this in the Hebrew, Matthew. Wherever the body is, there will be gathered the vultures. At that time, after the tribulation of those days, the sun will grow dark and the moon will not give forth its light. The stars fall from heaven and the host of heaven will be shaken. I think when it talks about wherever the body is, there are going to be gathered the vultures. They're going to say they found the body of Jesus Christ on the earth. Remember Jesus said if they say that, lo, he is here, he's in the secret chamber, or lo, he's over there, he's in the desert. He said, go not forth, believe it not. But you know what? Vultures will go where dead things are. Vultures love a dead body. They love to dance around on the street and peck and pull at the flesh. So where the body is, wherever they decide, oh, Jesus didn't really die. See, that's what the Jews are going to tell you. We told you he wasn't dead, that he died just a natural death. We found his grave over here in India. And then somebody on these evangelical soothsayers that are out there worshiping their demonic, Pharisaic friends are going to be jumping up and down like a bunch of vultures on a dead body saying, Oh, look, they found Jesus. This was the body. Oh, my gosh, can't believe it. We were all misled the entire time and made to believe a lie. But now we know the truth because the light is coming out of Israel. All praise be to God. What a nonsense of mess. Ah. <sighs> David's going to get quickened and brought up again from the depths of the earth. The abyss. There it is. To whom? All right. Revelation. And I behold, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became as blood. The sun stopped shining. The moon becomes blood. And the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. The heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. You know, this may not be what people think when they think of a blood moon. If the moon represents the bride of Christ, it could be because so many Christians are being beheaded because they didn't go along with the Noahide laws. Think about that one for a moment. Revelation chapter 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet. 
you know, that's symbolic in itself. I don't know if most people understand that that's like giving birth. In other words, she brings forth, not only she brings forth Christ, but Christ brings forth the children of God. So it's like a birthing process. She being with child cried, travail in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold, a great red dragon heaven, seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron. Her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Notice though the stars of heaven. That's the fallen angels. And the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. Remember, Jesus said, You're like a, you're a light. You're set up on a, you don't set the light, the candle underneath a, a bushel, but you set it up on, on the shelf there so it gives light to all the house. She's a lesser light, but she's reflecting the light of the sun. I think we've just about covered everything on this that I can recall. Ezekiel also, though, does bring in the word firmament is used there. I thought this was interesting, too, because he's using the firmament in relationship to the way these creatures that come to visit him. So over their heads of the living creatures, there was likeness of a firmament, like the color of the, of, of the terrible ice stretched forth over their heads above. The color of the terrible ice. Why would he liken the firmament like that terrible ice? The only place I know of of the terrible ice is at the South Pole, the entrance to the inner earth. And that would be where you would have the firmament beginning. Under the firmament were their wings conformable, the one to the other. This one of them had two which covered, and that one of them had two which covered their bodies. So it's just another expression, but in this case here, that firmament is not like the space above us here. And that's the reason I brought Ezekiel into this as well, is to show you that, in, in basically in su uh, summarizing what we have just looked at here, when we're looking at Genesis, and it speaks of this firmament, a lot of times people feel like it's the, it's the uh, outer space, the, the sky, etc. But we clearly have day one, a creation and a separation of light from darkness in day one. And then in day four, um, we have that happen again. The only difference is, is the light that happens here ends up being a light that rules the day, rules the night, uh, rules the stars of heaven. It seems to be more symbolic. And that firmament seems to be a separation of what's in the earth and what's outside the earth. Now, I do want to take, though, and share with you as well. Um, if you go to the chapter two of Genesis, and this is another one that I think that's fascinating. And the heaven and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work, in, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all of his work. Right. But when we get down here. No shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. There again, that in itself totally doesn't seem to make sense. There is no shrub on the field. There is no uh, was yet in the earth, and no herb in the field. And yet, Genesis chapter 1 just goes into this whole creation of all the plant life, animal life, and everything else. And now, here we are in Genesis 2, verse 5. No shrub of the field was yet in the earth. No herb in the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. And there was, no, there was not a man to till the ground. And yet, Genesis... Chapter 1, God makes man, he makes this earth, he makes all the trees, he makes all the fruit, all this beautiful place of vegetation. Everything is set in order there, and now we get in Genesis chapter 2, and none of us there. 
But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord. Now, I mean, granted, could it be that he's talking about, in other words, there's no grass? Maybe all the trees are made and stuff, but there's just no grass. I don't know. But here's what gets interesting. Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And it literally says that, The river exits Eden, but it's watering the garden. That is confusing. And if you go back to when David said here in the Psalms, he cleaved the rocks in the wilderness and gave them to drink abundantly as out of the great deep. And there it is. Out of the abyss. And he brought streams also out of the rock and caused the waters to run down like rivers. So when they were tra traveling in the desert and Moses smote that rock that had brought forth its water, it comes from within, from outside of the abyss or from the inner earth where those oceans are there. David clearly identifies that. And the rock represented Christ. So the waters that would be connected to that rock would have to be coming from where the tree of life was. And that appears to be inside of inner earth according to Genesis 2. And we also have plenty of other sources and other documents that support that as well. So, firmament. I believe when the waters are separated from the waters, it's the inner earth waters from the outer earth waters. And the fact that we have one light that is typed to rule and we can clearly see in the scriptures that Jesus Christ, his bride, rule both Christ was the light of the day. He said, I must work while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. And we know that we were given power to tread over all the enemy, which includes those stars, the fallen angels, which are the demons that we fight against. I mean, let's face it, that's what Paul says when he says, put on the full armor of God, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, against wickedness, principalities in high places. Those principalities in the Greek is called archaea, or the archons. Uh, those are those fallen stars that you're wrestling against, you're fighting against, but you have authority and a power over them. You clearly did. It was given to you all the way from the beginning of time when God created the heavens and the earth there. But there is coming a time where the sun and the sun will no longer shine and the blood or the moon will become as blood. So could that moon becoming as blood actually be Christians that are being beheaded for their testimony that they held? Could that be what we are going to see there? Is there more symbology what we have in Genesis? Part of it not, part of it true. And yet we've see, clearly in the scripture have proven, proven these things. What is it? Corinthians as well, right? For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. So we know that Christ is that light, clearly referring back to the Genesis account. So one of those lights are symbolic and the other light is natural light. You be the judge. You be the judge. So, love to hear your response here on our Patreon channel. God bless you. Thank you for listening. I know it's been a very lengthy message. I apologize for that lengthy time there, but it's very difficult to bring this out. And I don't know if I did it well enough, but I'm hoping that it'll make sense to you guys as well now. God bless you and have a blessed day.